Test, test, test. Test. Yo, welcome to NS9 Live. I am your host, Anthony Donardo. With me, as always, we have Tyler, a.k.a. Wagner, the, the hopeless. We have what Jim. And then we have a special guest tonight. We got Tim Williams on with us. How you doing, What's Tim? Up, guys? What's going on? Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for having or thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having <laughs> <laughs> Off to a flying start. All right, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Live show. <laughs> there it is. So, um, yeah, I guess, how's everyone doing this glorious Thursday evening. Would it be three days away from Pirates baseball officially? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, what did we, uh, by this point, we should already have a couple of discussions about uh, O'Neill Cruz, I feel like. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know about you guys, but this year, it, it obviously it sounds self serving coming from a prospect guy to say this, but it, it just seems like the only thing to focus on is, you know, in the future, like the, the prospects, like I, I don't care what they do this year because it's the difference between, are they going to get the first overall pick? Or are they going to get whatever? But I, I mean, how are you guys looking at the season? How have you guys been, you know, yeah. watching it so far? Yeah. I mean, I would be, I'm saying the same thing. Like the major league season is going to be a disaster. I'm going to watch all the games just because I'm a masochist and I hate myself. <laughs> But and it's it's going to be brutal to watch. But um, no, what what you're what we're really looking to, and and I think more than anything, because we didn't get to see it at all last year, right? So we have all these prospects. We just we just loaded the system up with a influx of talent over these these past twelve months, fourteen months, and we haven't been able to see these guys since 2019. So I'm really looking forward to the minor league season. Um, I think it's. Definitely, like you mentioned, um, it, it's definitely the most exciting part of this upcoming season. Yeah, and I think Jim kind of hit it on the head there with the minor leagues are the most exciting part. But more than that, we finally feel like we have a direction as Pirates fans. We're not a middling team right now. We're actually rebuilding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that part. <laughs> and, and me too. Like, I'm excited for baseball, period. Because I know last year we had 60 games, so... Yeah, it was cool. It was nice, but it's nice to have a full actual baseball season. But then on top of it, a real minor leagues, you know, season as well. Yeah, it's cool because obviously the Pirates are rebuilding. But like Jim and I talked about this on Wednesday. You know, we never saw the guys that have like been new of last year. They came over like Piguero and Malone. You know, like you never saw those in our system. And then even the new guys that have come over this year in trades, we didn't see them last year perform. So it's like we don't really know what we have because we never really got to see them, you know, most yeah. of them, especially because a lot of these guys are much younger, you know, not like in Neil Huntington where they're more of the triple A or major league type. type. So um, I'm excited for everything. I get to see baseball finally a real season and I get to see some minor league uh, play and kind of see what these prospects are about. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, easily the thing I'm most interested in. And I feel like it's going to be just a wave of information. Once minor league spring training starts every year, when we're doing the prospect guide or right afterwards, you know, we wrap up this massive production of like a, a frozen shot in time of all the information we know on every prospect. And then we get to spring training and just find out all new information. I, I feel like the, the stuff we're going to find out is going to change everything we know about the system in, in a sense that 
like you said, we, you know, we haven't had baseball in the minors since 2019. Some of these players, uh, I was talking to Quinn Priester for a feature um, like a week or two ago, we were discussing how, you know, look how many actual pro appearances he has that's not at the Altoona mm-hmm. site or the instructs, you know, th- this past uh, fall. I mean, there's so many guys from the 2019 draft who have barely played at all. If they've played 2020 draft, haven't even played anything. And it, it, it's just going to be, it, it's going to be crazy between that dynamic, but then also shortening the minor leagues. So you have, you know, just everybody coming back to show what they can do and not as many spots for them to uh, compete for this time around. So can I start that right there and ask Tim, you're obviously very deep in the prospect game. What the heck happened to Quinn Priester that he has just shot up (laughs) every ranking ever. So it was, uh, it's been a pretty interesting off season from my perspective on that. Um, I, you know, I, I do uh, obviously oversee our prospect rankings at uh, Pirates Prospects, which, uh, you know, the work that John Draker and Wilbur Miller do for that. I, I sound like Neil Huntington after the draft every time, like, you know, the, the typical, like, oh, our, the work of our area scouts is just, you know, invaluable. And But, like, I don't think it, it, it's interesting doing Baseball America and Pirates Prospects and, like, they're, they're totally different lists. And I love seeing the input that John and Wilbur have on that, you know, on that list and everything. But as far as Priester goes, there was kind of this discussion early on, like how high does he go? You know, do you, do you put him above Gonzalez? Do you put him above Cruz? Do you, you know, how much do you want to bet on this guy who you keep getting positive reports, but you still haven't seen that much barely in rookie ball and one start in short season, a ball. And it's a challenge for any player when they come in and they have a small sample size and you're, you're evaluating it on projection. But with a guy like this, it was just that, you know, reports were coming in so much. Uh, I, I remember what I was hearing outside of Altoona right after that ended before Instruct started, I started getting some really positive reports that, you know, we're kind of talking about pushing that potential top of the rotation ceiling, which, you know, the Pirates have had their fair share of those guys. They haven't worked out, obviously. They haven't reached that ceiling, at least not in Pittsburgh. So it's one of those where you're kind of a little gun shy to add that kind of ceiling to another guy so soon, especially. But I feel like it, he just continued it. And I, I think it's just – it's kind of a confidence thing where I was surprised when he was discussing it, but it, in a way where even as a first-round pick – he was talking about how he didn't know his role in the organization, how he, he wasn't sure until he got that call to Altoona. He got to show what he can do. He got to see where he fit in. He got to see that he had the support. And then you saw a different person after that who had not only the velocity increase, but better conviction with his stuff, was attacking hitters with, you know, more, I guess, intensity. And, uh, you know, with his stuff, plus fastball, plus curveball, got, you know, average to above average control uh, potential for average changeup. I mean, it, that's all you need right there is just to trust that that stuff is there. And, and I think that's what Priester has started to do. Even with the lack of games, it's been impressive that he's been able to do that. Where do you think, because this is another thing too, that kind of is throwing me off a little bit. Um, and we'll, we'll, we can, we, we're talking about Priester now, so we'll, we'll kind of, stick to him but with there not being a season last year for for these guys <clears throat> what's going to happen in terms of you know, like where where do they go where do they go this year so we mentioned Quinn, Quinn Priester played a little bit a little bit of rookie ball a little bit of short season like is he now going to skip what would have been his a ball season is, is he going to go to high a like what, what what is your feel on that yeah that's going to be a a challenge, especially with him and, you know, going to Altoona, I don't think that's going to put him actually in Altoona when it returns to being the double A level, but uh, I could see him getting definitely one of the A ball rotations. Uh, but 
you know, it, this is going to be an interesting season, not just for Priester, but for everybody, because you don't know how much they progressed off the field. Mm -hmm. And you could see somebody who, uh, you know, you guys have all followed prospects over the years. We've all seen that prospect who goes to a ball and just destroys for a month. And then they're up to Altoona by the start of May. I mean, hopefully we see a lot of that. We see a lot of rapid movement and we see a lot of, you know, people who quickly show that they have improved. But uh, I, I just think that uh, I, I would bet on an a ball, uh, but if he is, you know, just to kind of play it conservative, but if he is showing that, you know, he, he's kind of made that, step forward and he carries that over to games i could see him moving pretty quick because priester even though he's a guy out of high school not many innings he's a very advanced pitcher a very smart pitcher and i think it's not a lot from you know a ball to double a triple a to start getting him some work in the upper levels yeah i, I want to actually pivot this a little bit differently um i mean we we're talking about priester and this lack of you know baseball last year and such now 2021 is going to be a little different for minor league baseball. And obviously you're covering minor leagues and prospects. You know, I want to kind of hear your take. What do you feel about MLB changing? I mean, pretty much intervening and taking over minor league baseball and, you know, one baseball seems like baseball in, in general. Um, you know, what do you think about the minor leagues going forward? Oh man. Um, I'm not a big fan of it. <laughs> I mean, for one, they took out one of my favorite franchises, the West Virginia power, which was, just the epitome of minor league baseball, like the toast man, the, all the fans there. Um, I, I feel like every time I went to that stadium, we, you know, there were maybe 10, 15 people who followed the site who were hardcore, you know, pirates fans, not maybe not even pirates fans, but once they saw people in West Virginia, they followed them for life. And I think you have a lot of those minor league talents that have been eliminated and it, it's, it's this continued trend for baseball where they, they keep shooting themselves in the foot. They keep pushing away all this long-term, you know, long-term fan base just for short-term profit or short-term savings. I mean, it, this is another one of those cases where what was the core reason behind this? It was a cost saving move according to them to, you know, because apparently those final 40 teams were too much, but I think as far as the actual move, I don't like that they're kind of taking over the minors and reducing it and outsourcing the job to let everybody else develop the players, which essentially that's what it becomes. But I think it's going to be really interesting how that changes the process of who gets promoted and when, because with no short season league, you kind of don't get that choice. Like we were talking about with uh, Priester, or maybe with a, a guy who's a little less developed, you don't get that choice between do you send him to Morgantown or do you give him the push to full season? It's do you send him full season or do you, you know, just leave him in the spring training in the GCL until what point, you know, I, it, that's, that's going to be the most interesting thing. I think with the switch is just seeing how it, how it impacts the, the ladder up the, up the system. Yeah. And then, thank you for saying that because I think I was the only one on this on this podcast who kind of thought <laughs> I, the same way. I was way. going there, yeah. <laughs> so um, I agree. I, I hate what they're doing. Like, and, and really, mine comes down to kind of what you said. Like, there's these these towns across America, and mostly you're you're dealing with like App Appalachia, you know, the New York Penn League, um, and then you've got some teams out west in like the Pioneer League that are now just gone, right? And so you've got these teams that. From the you got these these people who live in small towns and they they follow these players from a young age, they reach the majors and you know they can say, hey, you know what I saw so and so play in Charleston, West Virginia, like that was really cool. Like I, I just think baseball had a unique thing with you know going with minor league baseball, and I I feel like they're just they're they're killing it, right? And we can argue that like for the sake of efficiency, and and you know this this new system's better, right? Do we, does, we should. does every, you know, does every team need six minor league teams full of 30 sure people? Don't. You know, probably not. Right. Yeah. The, the, the 20, the, the, the 15th to 20, 26th man on minor league teams, they're just there to take up a spot. Right. Um, but it's, I, I agree with you. It's just, it's a shame. Like I just, 
I love minor league baseball and, and to see it kind of dwindling away a little bit. It's a, so not to me. cut Tim off here because I know he has an opinion that agrees with the gym, <laughs> but just so that he gets the other side of the story here, I am a major league baseball fan. I'm not a fan of the West Virginia black bears. Mm-hmm. I would like the Pittsburgh pirates to draft a say Nick Gonzalez and me not wait. However long for him to get there, I'd make, I would prefer it to be as quick as possible and him not to face a bunch of soft tossing lefties in double a. <laughs> wow. I have to wait for 18 years for him to get up there. I know it's an exaggeration, but it feels this, like this is also a guy who feels he can hit a home run off Kyle Hendricks right now. So I hate that with a great assault. Okay. <laughs> to be he fair, he can hit a home run off Kyle Hendricks. That's a different argument. We'll get that through a different day. <laughs> totally unrelated to this matter. <laughs> I said I could hit a baseball off of him because he throws very slow. You said you could hit a homer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys riled me up. What did you want? <laughs> you go bigger, you go home. I mean, that's exactly. not the attitude to have. You don't just against Kyle Hendricks. You're not going for a bloop single. You're going for a. No, I mean, I'm going to taco on him. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, so, it was. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, you, I, I think another thing as far as, you know, we're talking about the Pirates, who does this move hurt? Um, you know, Jim, you were talking about not every team needs six minor league teams, but I can think if it's between the Yankees and the Pirates, one of those teams can live without six minor league teams or five or four or whatever and one of those teams could benefit from a lot of minor league teams, giving more guys playing time, more guys opportunity to break out. It's just you look at the moves that Major League Baseball has made over the last decade with restricting the draft spending, changing international. Now this, they all cut costs for the owners, but strategically they limit the small market teams because it then pushes everything up to the players, which – obviously fits the players union side of funneling money to the major league guys. And I think it it just, it's been constantly squeezing the minor leagues and now it's to the blatant point where they're removing actual teams at wholesale paces. So it's just, it's something that I feel, you know, obviously strongly about living around the minor leagues for, you know, the last forever, but, uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely something that I could I could talk about this all night, but uh, I'm sure we want to <laughs> talk about some prospects. Tim, it's going to cut your travel costs too. We'll cut it <laughs> for sure, for sure. I mean, I, I don't have to go to yeah. Bristol, Virginia anymore. I'm I'm not too sad about that. I, I love Bristol, but also I grew up too close to there, so it's a little too close to home. So mm, I feel that. All right, so we spent some time. We spent some time with Quinn Priester, right? Um, he was kind of he's the hot name. He's the name that that jumped up prospects lists. But um, there's still a guy who is still technically a prospect, and and I don't I'm, I don't know if we're going to spend too much time on him because he's also probably the one guy that we all know the most about. You know, not only us but also the people watching and listening to us. Um, but what are your thoughts on just the love? that key Brian Hayes has gotten, you know, from, from everybody this off season. I mean, obviously he's, he's your all's number one rated prospect, you know, on, on at that Pittsburgh baseball network, but, you know, across the board, Fangraphs has him seventh overall. The athletic has him 13th overall. ESPN has him sixth overall. MLB has him ninth overall and baseball America who you do their top 10 list for the pirates. They have him 15th overall. So he is a, uh, I mean, he's up there with the top, top names in minor league baseball right now. Okay, Brian Hayes, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I really like the, um, obviously, the offense in small sample last year. You hope that that continues uh, somewhat close to where he was at. But, um, you know, Hayes coming up through the minors, there, there was always that potential that he showed with the bat, you know, a, a smooth swing. Uh, great plate patience. Um, he didn't have a lot of power production in games. He had a cracked rib for a little bit and then you know, lost some weight and kind of struggled a little bit in the upper levels after that. But power started to come along there. And it, it just seems like everything started to click with him 
the defense has been there. Uh, you know, the offense obviously came on strong. I remember last year when, you know, everybody was talking about how there were no prospects in the system being kind of astonished that people were forgetting about Cabrian Hayes, that, you know, that was a very good prospect that was left for Ben Sherrington. He's kind of going to be the key to the rebuild here. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that a couple, you know, what was it like a month or two later, Hayes comes up and starts looking like the guy that you hope he's going to be the guy you can kind of build around on offense. Now, will that continue? Was that a one month sample size? I obviously don't think he's going to hit that much, but from what I saw and what, you know, was projected of him coming up, this matches more of the expectations when he was coming through the minors of a guy who can be a repeat all-star third baseman, defensive gold glove winner. I mean, it's a very exciting player to follow. And I, I, I think the, the only drawback would just be to be cognizant of the fact that some players – don't always just come up and light the world on fire for good. You know, he, he might see a little bit of a, a regression. The league might adjust to him, but long-term, I, I think that especially by the time the Pirates are competitive, he's going to be a very good player to build around. So I do have a question for you. Sorry to cut you off, Nardo. I'm sure you have a billion of them. No, we're good. <laughs> but the way I looked at Hayes was I hoped that he would be more like a Francisco Lindor who had – not shown much power in the minor leagues. And then he came up, obviously he showed the power. Do you see any similarities there where Lindor showed absolutely no power in the, in the minors and obviously has found it now, not so much in the first year, but is there something similar there where obviously it's a great glove, but the swing got him to the top of the rankings for a reason. So when I'm looking for, um, projecting power from a younger guy, especially, you know, thinking back to when I first saw Hayes, like out of high school, um, you know, obviously you're projecting a guy to grow and add some muscle and everything like that as he gets into his, uh, you know, late teens, early twenties. Uh, and, you know, some power may come from that, but I, I think with Hayes, it, it's just that his swing is so smooth. The bat speed is so quick that, you know, it, it it's something where, he made some adjustments this year. Right. Uh, I'm going off the top of my head, but you know, he kind of a little if bit I more of an open stance. Yeah. Yeah, and he it, also raised his uh, exit ra- raised forehead. the hands like a little bit away. And, right, and his know, launch angle went up a little bit. And yeah, and that's that's the thing when you have that natural, just smooth swing. Once you kind of change the way you're impacting the ball, once you kind of figure out how your body's working right. and you know how to how to approach it and stuff like that. That's when uh, I I think you start to see those changes. And that's one of the things that makes me think that this power surge from Hayes was Mm -hmm. a little bit more than a small sample size because there was something behind it and something that a lot of evaluators had been waiting on for a couple of years. Weirdly, one of those things I just looked at a Francisco Lindor and watched him in the minors and it was non-existent. And then he came up and something just clicked. And, and I think, I mean, as much as I know about him uh, from his minor league days, it's a similar situation where it, it's bat speed, it's a, a smooth yeah. swing, and, you know, just I, I don't know the specific adjustment he made, but that's yeah, I'm not sure either, typically but... a really good uh, good starter recipe for adding power later on. Right. And that's, that's a good comparison because, yeah, a lot of people in Cleveland were writing off Lindor, you know, he, not going to be the guy that they thought he was. And then he just reached the majors and well, Cleveland people are stupid. So. <laughs> okay, Tyler. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess, you know, you've touched on this a little bit and I think a lot of us are kind of wondering too. I mean, you said he's going to be a really good player. Like how do you value, how do you look at Kip Ryan Hayes in the future? I mean, is this a guy who are we looking at like a, a three to five war player or potentially even like a higher than five war player in, in the future of the Pirates? So I would like how say, good is this back going to be, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> um, I like the, uh, you know, the kind of format, the triple potential outcome. I would say like, uh, as far as a, a floor, I think he's got the potential to be kind of an average 
starting third baseman. The defense should get him there and the, the contact ability for sure. Um, I think as far as a ceiling, you're, you're talking about a guy who you could have a couple seasons over five war, you know, maybe three or four seasons, kind of a similar career arc to, you know, Andrew McCutcheon where you have that three war player and then he has a couple MVP seasons before he, you know, becomes too expensive and the pirates do what they do with those types of players. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that would be the ceiling that I would hope for from Hayes. And then somewhere in the middle, that three to five war player, like kind of a similar value to uh, a Starling Marte in the four to five range for several years. I, I think that would be a very good, you know, kind of a little bit aggressive, but from what we've seen, maybe not so aggressive. If you want to give a more likely outcome, that would be where I'd go. So a lot of pressure to put on a guy who's had one month of uh, major league experience, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that he's a special player who at the very least is capable of just being better than what we've seen at third base for most of what I remember about the pirates, but to uh, be fair, we haven't had much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no to, when you say a floor of two corner. war, that's, I, I can't think of many third basemen, maybe, you know, Josh Harrison in yeah. 2014 when yeah. he was playing everywhere and settled there, but, yeah, it's uh, he's already going to be an upgrade just based off his floor, but I, I think there's a player they can build around. Cool, cool. Uh, I'll tell you what, so before we get any further, just uh, some questions in here, which comes from Ethan. Um, <laughs> so Ethan wants to know... What do you think about uh, the peril? Actual question. <laughs> Ethan wants to know... And, and, uh, Ethan yeah, wants to know when I am going to finish the payroll page on the site. Yeah, Ethan well, I know he's probably to, dying for that. I think Ethan wants to know, like, I think, you know, with the with the with the cut of a couple teams, right? It means that there's going to be some players who are in this organization right. who are no longer going to be in the organization. Yeah. Who Who do you like? Who's like the way he placed it was like, what What high profile yeah. player do you feel is not going to make the the one eighty? The Pirates have high profile players. <laughs> yeah. I first of all, I love the branding of the 180 because it sounds like a an arc for like the X Men or something like that or like <laughs> the comics like they're doing a total reboot to boost sales and it's like here's the 180. It's like we're only doing 180 characters or something. Mm -hmm. But I I may do something like that for the site, uh, <laughs> like the 180 <laughs> countdown. We may have an article uh, for that, but. Um, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of any like high profile guys. I, I would more generalize and say the guys that I think are probably in the most trouble since, you know, essentially have lost about a year and a half of minor league development and spend, it will be about two years extra. Those guys who are in that 24, 25, 26 range who were kind of fringe prospects at 23, 24, and now they've had two years of we don't know what we're getting from them. And, you know, they're up to 24, 25, 26. I That's think you're going to see organizations, not just the Pirates, but everybody, when you're cutting two teams for every organization, you're going to see a lot of those guys. And I think that, uh, you know, the pickup of Dustin Fowler, we're going to see a lot more of those guys in the coming years as – the combination of the roster squeeze from removing two teams and the lack of development from losing, you know, well over a season, having another one kind of compromised, just, I, I think that it's, it's going to be a lot of the fringe prospects flooding the market uh, a little bit more. That would be where I would kind of focus my attention on. As long as my gotcha. dude, as long as my dude, Jake Snyder still has a job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's, uh, you know, but he read exactly. Yeah, I mean, college bat had didn't play last year. Yeah, he was. He's going to be one of those guys who is. Is, is this guy going to stick around? Yeah, and I think you have to look positionally too. Um, you know, the Pirates are very thin at uh, you know catcher, uh, outfield. Obviously, needs some depth throughout the system. So, I mean, positionally, uh, you might have a little bit of a better chance if you know you're a catcher, left-handed pitcher. Uh, an outfielder who can play center field. So I, I would probably remove those guys, but that's a really good, uh, it, it's something I've been kind of looking at putting together a depth chart, trying to, you know, figure out what 
you know, this system looks like at the, at the start here, but uh, you know, trying to get a feel for how many people they have to trim from the roster. That's going to be a, a really challenging thing. I was going to say this, this whole year, we got you working this year, Tim. I mean, after yeah. all the, the loss of the minor league system and the pandemic, like all this stuff that's happening and now the rebuild and Ben Charrington just grabbing all these players, you know, you're a busy <laughs> man, I'm sure. <laughs> oh man. I mean, I feel like in, well, in the standard of the month, we added, uh, what, it was like a dozen prospects to, uh, our top 50 <laughs> consideration. And then, um, yeah, you know, yeah. John had a write up of a dozen more players who were signed out of the international ranks. It's like, we almost could have released two different prospect guides this year. Like the, the pre Christmas Eve version. And then <laughs> here's how everything has changed. <laughs> you got like a patch, you know, like download patch, you know, B2 to B21 over here. <laughs> yeah. Ethan says he's been uh, he's been work, working on the cut list. He said he's up to 33 cuts. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. So we'll we'll have to compare some notes here and uh, you know, just see where uh, where he's going with this. So also, it's a good time to to plug it too cuz you mentioned the prospect guy. So why don't you tell us and this is the 10th anniversary uh, why don't you go ahead and plug and tell us about your prospect guys you put out this year as you do yeah. every year. So, I mean, this, this year was kind of uh, different for that. Um, you know, every year for the prospect guide since, you know, first year we did it uh, heading into the 2011 season, um, the focus was have a place for our top 50 prospects and have a place for reports on every player in the system. Uh, it, it was kind of designed just for me for when I'm at games I can quickly flip through to a guide and see information about the player in front of me. But for the, you know, the 10th anniversary book this year, we, we have that, we have the top 50, we have reports on everybody, but we kind of went for a, a little bit of a different approach, making it an actual book. And I wrote a lot about just player development, which obviously was a big issue for the pirates towards the end under Neil Huntington um, kind of, I don't know how it will turn out. Like, you know, to be honest, uh, it's, I wrote a lot of stuff that was based off my experiences uh, mixed in, you know, some long interviews that I had with uh, Ben Sherrington, uh, Quinn Priester kind of on the same topic and everything. And then just at the end of it ripped off a very long and probably confusing poem as uh, part of a, uh, uh, a writing process on, you know, just, don't want to spoil it, but, you know, not being afraid to fail and how that's kind of a major thing that prospects have to, uh, have to kind of overcome. It, it's, it sounds so simple, but, uh, you know, again, I go back to Priester talking about his, his confidence levels. I mean, you've got a plus fastball, you've got a plus curveball, but until you're not afraid to fail with those pitches, I mean, you're, you're probably going to fail. <laughs> you're probably going to throw it in the wrong spot trying to make it too perfect. And it, it's that type of stuff that you guys have probably been so frustrated with the vague comments of I'm trying to do too much. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do the, the, those type of athlete comments, but it, it's, it, it was my first attempt. I feel it like trying to explain in long form what they're talking about and like kind of, the whole process inside the mind. We have everything in the book as normal showing what we see on the field. And that was a challenge in and of itself in a pandemic year, getting all that information. But uh, I, I really had a lot of fun kind of breaking into the development side of that. And uh, so that's what we have this year. And um, the digital version's available at Pittsburgh Baseball. It's a pay what you can. I know it's been uh, tough this year for people financially. so. If you can't afford it, if you're still looking for stuff to read about the Pirates, feel free to take it for free. Tell your friends about it. Just, you know, read up on the system and, uh, you know, keep checking back throughout the year to follow these guys. Yeah, and I can I can attest. I mean, I, I think a lot of our viewers probably, you know, check out your site a lot. But but gosh, I've, I mean, I've been following following you and your, your site for more than a decade now, I feel like. And it's, uh, it was the first, it was the first website I ever paid for news, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, congrats on that honor. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> but thank you. you. You mentioned 10 years ago. I feel like that was like yeah. the kind of golden era of like pirates blogging. Like uh, it was yeah. just like there were so many great blogs. Like when yeah. I started up, you know, it was like Bucks Dugout and Y Gabs were the biggest ones. And then I feel like Jim, you were starting up around the same time, like 2008, 2009, or yeah, I want to say it was probably yeah, 2008. Yeah. yeah. Tyler, Anthony, when did you guys get into the game? Just Pirates blog. Well, <laughs> our, our so, claim uh, to fame for the North Shore Nine is we started right after the 98 win season. Yeah. So literally, we, we we came onto the scene and the Pirates started playing I, terrible. So. I remember it was around like 13 that you guys uh, you guys started showing up, and yeah. It, I, I just yeah, I feel like it hasn't, been, it hasn't been as fun as Jim. You know, Jim got to see the rise and like you know the great seasons. Then we yeah. came. It's it's just all downhill. So I've been yeah. on Twitter we're, for we're a while. GameStop. We're, we've been GameStop. GameStop <laughs> like two weeks ago. Just just yeah, hold yeah. strong. <laughs> I've been doing. <laughs> we're, we're holding. We're trying, man. <laughs> My original Twitter started in '09. Then I switched to the Pirates Twitter in '13 because I was tired of annoying my friends. <laughs> and then. Uh, for some reason, I started blogging. I actually follow Kevin Cray, who I know Tim knows from yeah. Point of Pittsburgh uh, for Steel City Buzz. And then God only knows how I ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So, yeah. But uh, no, yeah, definitely. If you, if you haven't checked out um, Pittsburgh Baseball Network, it's it's awesome. And especially this year in particular, it's going to be a huge resource because you're going to have a ton of content and it's going to be the content that Pirates fans are looking for because they're, they're going to want, they're going to want stuff about the prospects because the major league product isn't going to be too pretty. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. It's not so much Brian Goodwin right now. We're worried about, it's, <laughs> you know, yeah. it is just what it is. Yeah. I mean, I am interested in seeing what Todd Frazier and Tyler Anderson can yeah. do, but, uh, you know, only to find out what they can get at the trade deadline. <laughs> there, you <go. laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's, let's head, let's kind of shift back to the prospects a little bit more. You know, we, we, we talked about Priester. We talked about Hayes. Um, but it's been kinda... over, it's been over 30 minutes and someone's not been mentioned yet. So let's, well, let's go, let, let's kind of go back. Let's go down the list, right? So next on your list, O'Neill Cruz, um, definitely a um, controversial off season, not really controversial, but a, it, he was very newsworthy off season and not for the good reasons. Um, and, and, and it looks like, I don't know if it's just, he's, I don't know if that played a part in it, but, you know, nationally, you know, I'm feeling like he's kind of taken a little bit of a hit. I don't know if it's because of that or if it's because people are realizing, hey, maybe this guy can't play shortstop. You know, what what, what do you what do you guys think? What do you, what do you think on that? I don't know if it's the uh, the shortstop thing as much because I think that was assumed before. Um, I, I think it's easy to lose the prospect shine, uh, you know, especially at the national level. Um, and, and drop a lot, especially when you have a very extreme risk guy like Cruz, where you've got one, maybe, uh, I think the highest system we had graded, or the, the highest ceiling we had graded in the system uh, this year, but to to have a guy with that type of ceiling, but also the chance that, you know, he, he might just bust, I mean, it's the boomer bust impact here. You can see how some people might knock him down a lot if there's any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of shine that gets removed from his prospect status. So that, that would be my guess, but I'm interested in hearing you guys. I mean, I, well, I, I guess think... my thing too is, you know, with the loss of the baseball, minor league baseball, mm -hmm. I feel like is he maybe one of the, the people that that might hurt the most, you know, with, with him being such a high risk, high reward, you know, with a lost mm -hmm. season, does that maybe hurt his prospect status? Is that maybe why people were, you know, dropping them down some? And that could be too, because I mean, there are some guys who are going to need actual playing time versus some guys who, like you know, Priester can work on stuff off the field and come in with cleaner mechanics and a better fastball. I I don't know if you know Cruz can get the same effect because a lot of what he needs to do is really see upper level pitching and 
see how close he is to the majors and see what he needs to work on. So I, I would agree that that's definitely an impact. Um, you know, I, I don't know, obviously, what led to him dropping down, but uh, that would be a as good of guess. Uh, you know, it, it would be something I would consider. Um, maybe kind of in a, in a blanket sense for everybody, but Cruz would be one of the guys uh, that would benefit from playing time more than other guys. And I mean, you think of it too, like the last time anybody really saw him was the Arizona fall league. And that was a yeah. dreadful performance. Like he, he did not, he did not play very well there. Yeah. Um, so that maybe that kind of just, that's everybody's last impression of him right now. I think what's, yeah. I think it's interesting because like you mentioned, he out of everyone in this system, I think he has the highest ceiling, right? Like he, you know, he could, he could be like an Aaron judge type talent player in in the majors where, you know, he could, he could hit for 40, 50 home runs, you know, Uh, like he's got that type of bat, but he could also be just a complete bust. And so it's, he's, he's so that, I think that's why we just, we, we got to see him, you know, we want to see yeah. him against upper level pitching. Cause right now, you know, he had a little bit of double a time, but you know, let's, let's see how he does against some pitching. That's a little bit more polished. Yeah. Maybe I'm just thought I err on the side of caution, but I am all aboard letting him play shortstop. And I know we've all heard all the complaints about him fielding ground balls and how quote unquote silly it is that he is fielding ground balls at shortstop because he won't play there. I say, let the guy play there until he proves he can absolutely positively not play there. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to that bat. And I don't know that he's going to show enough with the bat to really be what he is in the prospect rankings a couple of years ago. I can see that concern. I mean, there's, there, there's definitely for me a um, kind of a uh, Gregory Polanco cautionary tale, if you will, where you've got this highly across Maybe the board bigger. tools for day. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like I, I think, especially in the power sense. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the very first evaluation I got after he came over to the Pirates was he has Pedro Alvarez power, and. Mm-hmm like the way he hits the ball, the way he makes contact, it's that hard, like he just chopped down a tree and hit a golf ball with it, like that sound. But he, I I think that, I I, I don't know. I I think the power is going to carry him. Obviously the bat is going to carry him. Uh, You're right, Tyler. But I I don't mind the, the decision to keep him at shortstop right now because who is he blocking that, you know, I, I can't see anybody he's projected to block and I can't see anybody who is projected to eventually kick him off the position for sure. Uh, you can make an argument that Cruz isn't going to stick at shortstop, but you can make that argument for every single shortstop prospect as mm-hmm. well. So, you know, until he shows that he can't go ahead and keep him there because if he's athletic enough to at least be passable at shortstop, it's, I don't think going to be, take him long to learn right field. God, you know? speak to me, Tim. <laughs> speak to me. I just had this argument. I mean, if a guy can play major you, league shortstop. You definitely, you definitely did. I saw that one. If, we're, on the, we're on the same page. I mean, I, 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 I think mean, that maintain the value while you can. But Exactly. I think a major league, a guy that can make to the major leagues playing shortstop, he can learn first base. We're not talking about Pedro Alvarez who couldn't throw a baseball. We're yeah. not talking about Josh Bell who he wasn't a great athlete. And, We're and I think the guy that played the middle infield. Pedro is a really good example of how we can get ahead of ourselves sometimes with uh, you know kind of comparing the difference between what we project a player to eventually become and what we're going to give him a shot to be right now. And, you know, Pedro Alvarez eventually moved off third base. And that's what everybody said from draft day. He won't stick at third base, but he stuck at third base for a little while. And there was a brief time before he completely forgot how to throw that he was starting to look better defensively than offensively. I think, what was it like the 2000, 
11 or 12 season, he had kind of a yeah. one good defensive year, or third and it might have been 13. Yeah, because 13 was, or 14 because 15, I believe it was, was right before 14 because that was yeah. the year everything fell apart and then Josh Harrison took over. Yeah, I mm, believe. Good point. But uh, they got Ike Davis. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, same situation here. I mean, Cruz, I don't project him to stick at shortstop, but no. is that he's not going to stick at shortstop at age 20? 3, 24, 25, or is it 29, 30, 31? I mean, when are we talking moving him here? And again, who is moving him off the position? And right Tim, it's not just that to me. It's that shortstop is a position that he is accustomed to. Yeah. The big thing is that he needs to develop that bat. So let's not yeah. throw another thing at him right now. Let's let him develop the bat and play where he knows how to play. I like that argument too, because I mean, with everything he's been through this off season, obviously a very traumatic experience, um, you know, getting into the car wreck and everything, he, he's already going to be adjusting to upper level pitching. That's going to be a challenge after taking some time off, not finishing 2019 as strong. I mean, it's, it, it's not really, necessary right now and it's probably not a good idea to overload him by saying hey we also want you to try a new position on top of this mm-hmm. and I, I think that's something that there's plenty of time for down the line and you know might as well keep him there for now I, I also think that we need to remember that this game is changing I mean what shortstop plays shortstop you know what mm-hmm. what third baseman doesn't play shortstop and what second baseman doesn't play the outfield at least a couple times a game now. So, I mean, all the talk of he needs to play here, he needs to play here. I think eventually he's going to need to play everywhere. It's just going to get down to more athleticism. And he's the type of player who, when you're talking about moving guys around and positioning them based on range and where people are going to hit the ball, that's where he could add some value, especially if the pirates kind of go to the next level with that, with, some of the guys they have. I think we are like what three years removed from the Brewers having zero short stops on the roster. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, Pirates could go uh, yeah. the other extreme, go with like a bunch of short stops who don't project a <laughs> stick and just yeah, right. know, have them all yeah. over the field. <laughs> Look, you if go. you can play the middle infield, you can play anywhere. That's my opinion. Yeah. So speaking of prospects who might not be able to stick a shortstop, it brings us to our next guy, <laughs> right? Um, first round pick last year, Nick Gonzalez. Um, just unbelievable PlayStation like college numbers, tore up the Cape Cod League. So I mean, exciting bat for sure. We, I don't really know how it's going to play, you know, in regular elevation yet. But um, so first off, you know, is is he someone you think? is going to be able to play shortstop or, and, and two, how excited are you about the bat? I think no for shortstop in terms of the traditional look, but yes, in terms of, you know, the modern day playing all around the field, he'll probably get some time at shortstop, but more second base as a, as a starter eventually uh, the bat. I heard a lot of really good things um, this off season to the point where, I think the expectation is that at least one batting title, you know, that that's the yeah. type of hitter he's <laughs> going to be where it's like, like a, you know, Freddie Sanchez type career where you, you've got just a great pure contact hitter who can be maybe a little bit more if uh, you know, all else breaks right with the, with the defense, with the, you know, the power with everything else. But I'm, I'm really intrigued to see what he can do, uh, especially if they kind of move him over to second base a little bit sooner, which it sounds like they're going to be moving him around. Uh, That's what, you know, Ben Charrington mentioned to me in December, and I don't think that's changed from anything I've seen so far. Uh, But kind of, you know, between Cruz, between Gonzalez, uh, you know, Hayes, obviously, they're building some – a collection of really good bats, but really good infield bats where, you know, you, you can kind of start dreaming about a really good offensive lineup where it's not just the key offensive spots that everybody has, but it's, you know, they have second base, shortstop, third base, like 
prime hitters here. And that's, that's really, you look at a lot of the contending teams, that's something where finding value where other people are struggling to find players, that's where they can get ahead here. I like it. Batting title, at least Batting one. Title sounds that's, good. Yeah. Like that, and, and again, yeah. you know, this is what if Pirates you want to get aggressive with them, for, you know? that's not too too aggressive. I wouldn't say based on what I heard. So. Awesome. Well, I mean, should we just go down the line? Should we just stick this in the middle infield? Because it seems yeah, like the Pirates yeah, are stocked it. on them, <laughs> which mean, is you know a lot different yeah. from the, the past yeah. regime. It seems. You know, we got Cruz talking about Gonzalez. So let's go to Peguero. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So out of the shortstops, um, he would be the guy I would project to stick. Um, you know, just I haven't seen him obviously in games because uh, you know the pandemic right. and. But uh, everything that I've seen on him and everything that I've heard, uh, he's got the best chance to to stick at the position and be kind of a really all around kind of dynamic, athletic shortstop like two-way you know a a two-way player who can provide value on defense but also you know be a kind of impact top of the order type guy on offense um another guy who again gives them a chance for a lot of offense from the infield nice and you know again we're talking about Pagero here let's let's stick it's a trade the Marte trade you know also another guy that you didn't get to see last year um because of the pandemic and the loss of minor league baseball but maybe speak to us a little about uh, Malone. So Malone is. Um, Did you say Brian? <laughs> I said Malone. He just said Malone. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Malone. <laughs> we'll call him Brian then too. Brian like Malone. a hybrid of like Brian Morris and uh, Brendan like, Malone. Uh, <laughs> like how I called uh, Prin Queister the other day. <laughs> Prin Queister. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I really like the um, the slider uh, from Malone. It, it grades really high, uh, probably one of the best in the system and an upper 90s fastball at a young age. Uh, the, the Pirates have, outside of their top five, they've got a collection of a couple pitchers who could very easily, one of them can jump up in the next year even and be the next Priester, join Priester as another potential impact rotation arm. Uh, Brendan Malone, um, you know, Tana Thomas were, you know, really big on him. I like uh, Cody Bolton more, less as a top of the rotation guy, more as a just solid starter who might be able to produce middle of the rotation results if he kind of carries over what we saw pre-pandemic. Um, so I, I like the pitching with uh, with those guys, but Malone is definitely emerging as the guy for me that that leads the list just with his, you know, the the fastball slider combo at a young age and, you know, just everything that uh, he's shown so far in such a, a small sample size, again, like Brewster. I mean, we've, we've barely seen these guys, so right. it's definitely a challenge evaluating them. Like so, I, so you talked about Malone. You talked about Thomas. Who's the guy that you're really looking forward to seeing this year that might not be on the radar because I know I've got one in my mind. Um, and I'm really hoping you say. <laughs> so I'm looking over the list right now, and I think, uh, you know, in the kind of mid-tier area, I'm really interested in uh, Eddie Yeen, uh, mm, the pitcher they that. got back from uh, the uh, in the Josh Bell trade along with uh, Will Crow. I think he's got a lot of, uh, a lot of upside there. And then um, – I would say kind Scroll of a, down that list a little further deep sleeper. I, I do like the, uh, a lot of the international guys. I think, yeah. um, keep speaking. Rodolfo, <laughs> Nolasco, Solomon, yeah, Maguire. not quite. Mojica. That, that who you're there it with? is. Come on. Mojica, Mo- you know. Mojica is Tyler. Dude. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Yeah, so Mojica. so what do you guy. like about Mojica? Walk great, strike out. I don't think right now he can hit a breaking ball from what I've seen. Love the bat speed. Size might be a problem. But I will take a dude that rakes in baseball. Yeah. Concerns I've out heard, him. obviously, the size could move him to first base, putting more effort on the bat. Yeah, I've I watched the entire 
Twitter feed with Drecker today <laughs> yeah. about his weight. <laughs> yep. But I mean, he, there are, uh, you know, some scouts who feel like he could still hit enough that it won't matter where he plays. But that, it's going to be another one of those things where obviously he's going to need playing time to get used to breaking balls and all yeah. the other I mean, I, wonderful things the upper levels bring. Yeah, I watched a few videos. Breaking ball did not do him well. Yeah. But yeah, it's it, it's tough. I mean, it that's one of the biggest things that's changed since I started covering prospects. There's so much focus on the lower level guys, but it, it's so easy to forget how raw these guys are. It's I mean, most of them have barely played organized games, so you there's a lot to work on with those guys, but also a lot of uh, a lot of potential for them. I, I like his bat. Um, I I tend to grade down potential first baseman unless they're in the upper levels. So he's lower on my list than, uh, than others. I like the, it's uh, always the Jose players. Asuna level, which Basically, I hate. Yeah, Jose, yeah. I hated Jose Asuna, but we, yeah, we got a lot of, uh, we had like a cult following for Asuna on our, uh, on our <laughs> session. Like, like but a, if I'm, be- there's a call following for Jose Asuna somewhere on yeah. pirates Twitter. And I don't understand it. <laughs> But if yeah, I'm being it, honest, it's the, hard, the one guy, <laughs> the one guy I'm looking forward to is actually Nick Gonzalez. Yeah, yeah, it, that bat, you know that that's I, what I want to see. I mean, all the reports we've seen. Yeah, how do you qu- how quick? I mean, with being a college bat, a little bit more advanced, how quick can he move through the system? Man, that's tough because we haven't even seen right <laughs> Sherrington make any kind of moves or uh, anything but I mean looking at just other you know other standards set around the league I would think if he reaches the upper levels this year maybe you know by the end of next year you could see him at the earliest just mm-hmm. advanced college bat um, if he is as advertised i could see him moving that quick but obviously that's just talking about in theory uh the player i would i'm really interested to see how uh charrington moves these guys around and how aggressive he is for a guy like that a couple quick questions here because we're already we're about an hour now but um out of all the trades that happened this off season tons of talent you know got got brought into the system who Who's your favorite? You know, out of all the guys that we acquired this year, who, you know, who are you most looking forward to seeing this year and uh, looking to jump up the prospect rankings, you know, for next year? I think, uh, I mean, I said Yeen earlier. Um, yeah. But I, I really like, uh, I'm interested in, uh, I'm trying to remember the trades they came in, but uh, uh, Kanan Smith, uh, the outfielder they got from the, the Tyon trade? Yeah, yeah so that was the that Tyon, was the Tyon trade. trade. Yeah. Yep. yeah, uh, you know, I, I really – we may have ranked him too low. I think we, we had him ranked uh, 40th. And the stuff I've been reading on him since, it's – you know, there, there's a chance that he could move up uh, a lot. I'm interested in watching him. And then uh, – uh, Escato, the uh, the shortstop they got in the San Diego lower level guy. I really like that. Um, you know, Sherrington's going after the lottery ticket type guys. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the development system has been lacking for the Pirates. I uh, haven't been able to produce guys to their highest upsides, but if he can fix that, he's kind of doubling down by then taking a bunch of guys who they can develop up and turn into better prospects. So I, I, I think that it's really interesting to see him go after the types of returns he went after uh, w- with those trades. And then some of the trades, I, I think, at the deadline and after for international money, I think was, you know, really creative, kind of making yeah. the most of his limited resources, basically, to get any kind of value into the system. So. Now, like now, you're speaking, Dyson. now you're speaking Donardo's <laughs> language with international money. <laughs> <I was thinking. laughs> It's sad there's not going to be that this year. Like, it, I, I, I know, keep right? typing it up, and I'm like, nope, not – took that away. <laughs> and there's about 18 billion questions I could ask you, but I'll let you know the rest of the next one. 
Well, I was just going to say, and we're talking about Charrington and all these trades and such. So one thing I just want to bring, and maybe get your opinion on this, okay? And I know it's it's still very fresh, it's very young in his tenure. So to get a true comparison is probably tough. But if you were to give some type of comparison of Ben Charrington and Neil Huntington, I would say, is there a difference? And if so, what's the biggest difference that you're seeing right now, the way Charrington's operating in this rebuild? Man, I, I'm not sure I would – be able to tell right now. I feel like it was years before I became a true Neil Huntington apologist, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, so, uh, All right, Tim Shillians. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I don't know when I can get there for Charrington. I mean, you know, but, uh, I want to, I want to see him exceed where Huntington was. So I, I'm not going to be impressed if he gets the Pirates back to the playoffs because I think we all agree that's the floor. It, you know, that that's not an upgrade just getting back to the playoffs. It's getting back to the playoffs, getting further and staying there longer. And it requires a much better plan than what Huntington had at the end. I think Huntington did a great job getting the Pirates to a point where we can sit here and talk about the playoffs without fear of everybody watching, laughing at the concept. You know, it wasn't that way before Huntington took over. But now there, there's kind of a race expectation. I, I don't know if Charrington can do that. We've seen him have success in Boston, but to do it in a smaller market that has been behind on some of the emerging trends on both the hitting and pitching side, on incorporating technology and analytics onto the development side. I mean, he's, he's having to take a system that is behind – both competitively as a small market team and strategically as a team that's fallen the last couple of years, it's going to be a challenge. Um, but you know, I, I don't have any predictions or comparisons. I, I just think he's, he's got a really interesting uh, task in front of him. And I'm, I like what I've seen so far uh, about the approach, mostly because I, I think I forget who said it earlier, but there's actually a plan now. There's actually a rebuild. I, Tyler, I think you said that, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just – Tim, I'll take you right inside of our group chat today. <laughs> and it'll be real quick. My argument today was that I don't believe that Neil Huntington did a great job of actually rebuilding the Pirates. In the his early years, the, the, the absolute yeah. first time around, yeah. I do not think that he did a great job of rebuilding the pirates. Yeah. I think he did an absolutely phenomenal job of collecting a bunch of players that were very shrewd moves and building a team that was actually a very good team. But when it comes to the point of tearing down the team that he was given and building a team for the long run, I don't think he did a good job of that. My hope Do you is, think that that's, uh... is the opposite kind of more because of the speed that it took them to get there or uh, as far as, you know, what they did once they got there. I think that what he tore down got him absolutely nothing that contributed towards the winning teams. Mm -hmm. I can see I mean, that yeah. because, I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into those teams, but I, I think the real heart of it was a lot of the moves that they made that were separate from the rebuilding process and yep. the farm system, the Russell Martin, Francisco Liriano, AJ Burnett, stuff like mm -hmm. that, that, that really fueled exactly. them for a couple of years. And the farm system mm -hmm. was almost more of a complimentary piece rather than the, the fuel. Yeah. And if we're talking about what he drafted and what he traded for when he tore that team down, mm -hmm. you got Pedro Alvarez, you got Jordy Mercy and you got Garrett Cole. Yeah. Which I, think, I don't, I don't think so, he did much with it. Yeah, I, I think that's where it, it's interesting, though, as far as, um, you know, looking at the the long term development of the organization, because those first two drafts under Huntington, even the first three really were not not strong. But after those first two, especially after that 2009 draft, uh, which, you know, the Tony Sanchez draft, the. Uh, all the prep pitchers who none of them, uh, you know, worked out. Their scouting department got overhauled. By the time the 2011 draft came around, most of those scouts from 2009 who he kind of inherited and, you know, 
didn't get a chance to uh, replace, they were gone by that point. And we saw a lot better drafts from 2011 on. Um, I, you look at what Sherrington's done so far, he's kept largely a lot of the same scouts. Uh, I don't know if he's going to replace that, if he's going to go on the same timeline. That's the type of stuff I look at. You know, it, it took Huntington two to three years to overhaul the scouting department. Is Sherrington going to need to do that? Or has Huntington left him a scouting department he can be confident in to where now he can focus on the stuff that Huntington left short, which is player development, obviously. And that's where he's focusing. And the fact that he's kept the scouting department around and you know trusted them with Nick Gonzalez and trusting them heading into the first overall pick. I, I, I just think that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's an interesting look that I've been, I've been kind of <laughs> looking back on it in that way in where was the system before Huntington took over? How did he change it? And what did he leave for Charrington? And I, I think that the drafts were definitely bad those first couple of years, but you saw some changes as a result of that, that I think were lasting and better for the organization. And I also think the weird part of it is that I don't believe Huntington really did draft that well, but we're going to see actually Huntington draft well now with Sherrington, <laughs> yeah. because we look at a priest or we look at a Hayes, we look at a, or not even draft for drafted a yeah. traded for a cruise, a, it's going to be um, almost this, the same situation yeah. as a little field where it's got a Marte. They're a winning Marte. with Tomlin's players. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. So Coward's player. Have, <laughs> I mean, but my point is, yeah. is he going to be able to, we watched Huntington be, make really shrewd moves. Obviously you already mentioned the Burnett, the Liriano. Is he going to be able to build for the long term? that I don't know that Huntington was able to do. Yeah. And that's where the player development really hurt because the window closed in a hurry. Once Mm -hmm. they got away from, we're making only shrewd moves. There was a point, it was around 2015, 16, where the cost of a reclamation pitcher went from 5 million for Edison Volquez to now you're paying 12 million for the chance of somebody coming off of surgery. And it it got to a point where they had to rely on the farm system and it made it obvious that that wasn't going to be working out for them. So I I like that uh, they're focusing on the farm system now. Um, And I think that in what, 2032, when Matt Arnold is the next general manager, (laughs) uh, we'll have a really interesting comparison about how Ben (laughs) Charrington left Matt Arnold, nothing at all in the system. Unlike what Neil Huntington left for Ben Charrington. Well, let's book yeah. it. So are you are you available March 4th in 2032? Oh, probably so. I mean, I'm just <laughs> pretty right. much waiting around for uh, clear your calendar. For prospect videos and WandaVision episodes. So there we go. <laughs> <sighs> well, I mean So yeah, what else we got? What yeah. what other prospects? Let's hit this rapid fire. Let's see. Well, let's see. Say, there was How someone about... who asked in the chat. Okay. Uh, so I'll bring it up here. So there's someone asked in the chat about Michael Burrows. So what are your okay. thoughts on Michael Burrows? I like the uh, velocity increase. Um, uh, another guy who I believe the latest reports we got were uh, up to 96, 97. Um, and he, pretty good frame kid, uh, had better control than most people, um, most, most high school pitchers uh, out of the draft. But one of the many guys who, again, we don't we don't have a lot of experience, and then it's been a couple of years. I do like that he has improved, though, and there, there's been a shown improvement as far as the velocity. Um, and it, he and Braxton Ashcraft, I I'm kind of hoping that they they both end up in uh, in high A this year, um, just selfishly because I live right next to it. So <laughs> I, I'd really like to see them. Uh, after the layoff, just to see where those guys are at right now. Um, Shailen Polanco, really the yes. big international signing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest they've ever had, like uh, outside of Haredi, I think he's the second biggest, but uh, I'm really interested to see, um, you know, obviously potential five tool guy uh, could stick in center field. Maybe it's probably too far off to say, but, 
just getting that first look at him, uh, you know, seeing if he's as advertised, that's going to be uh, pretty exciting this year. And then hopefully, um, you know, he's able and advanced enough to make it to the, to the U S by the end of the year, if it's for instructs or something else, so we can get maybe a better look. Yeah. I was going to uh, ask, is DSL still going to be a thing I'm assuming? Yeah. I'm, I'm not too sure about that. I mean, I, <laughs> I would assume it would be the same. I mean, it, it's complex. It's, uh, you know, it's the same as the GCL uh, in that they can just travel around from complex to complex. So it should be, you know, a little bit easier to control if they can do it elsewhere in the minors, they should be able to do it there, I would think. But who knows? I just want to add in real quick here too, just to be a real quick answer to it. But um, because of the Polanco signing, you know, is this maybe something more to see from Sherrington? Is this what you might feel is, the way he operates, more of the headliner type prospects or more of the let's just gather a bunch of prospects and hope one pans out? I think it could uh, be a difference, especially if you look at, um, you know, Huntington didn't use a large percentage of his budget on any one player. He spread it out a lot and uh, tended to avoid the – what they used 40% of the budget on this one player for this year, which, you know, it's – not a bad approach, but uh, it, it's definitely a massive change from what we've seen before. Um, these moves also take several years to come together. Uh, it's several years of scouting and everything like that. So it could be that this was all put in place under Huntington. It could also be that Huntington wouldn't have gone that high and somebody else would have outbid it. So I, I don't know. I, I would be really interesting to uh, really interested to see that. Uh, especially, I mean, uh, there's so much talk about payroll that, in, in this town, like with this team, there's so much, so much. Focus there is. On, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you guys hear about it. I, people talk I've about never it. Never heard of it. So. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there's this, you know, this belief that, I don't know, I, I guess I, the way I've always seen it is Bob Nutting sets the budget. The general manager decides how to spend it. And we saw Huntington spend one way, and I'm really interested to see how Sherrington's going to spend now, if it's going to be the same way or if you're going to see a little bit more risk for some individual players. Uh, that could be a really interesting thing to look at, especially if the mm -hmm. Pirates start to look in 2022, 2023 at are they potentially a contender or close to it with a $40, 50000000 million payroll, a bunch of league minimum guys, and – money that they should have to spend like i i think that's where this is at the major league level but i i would really be interested to see if that same type of spending approach carries over to the big leagues where we start to see guys that huntington wouldn't have spent that much money on that Cherryton's willing to take the risk on how about hudson go, go ahead tyler right. hudson head Hudson head. head, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, love that they're adding more uh, more center fielders to the system. I said earlier that's that's weak. Uh, it's a weak area. Um, we have him uh, ranked right there with Swaggerty, uh, which we're on the lower end for Travis about. Swaggerty. But uh, <laughs> I, I like. I, I think that between those two, they have a, a pretty good chance at getting a. Um, you know, a, a potential average starter or better in center field. Um, Swaggerty will get the first shot. I think that uh, that Hudson Head has maybe a little bit higher ceiling, but obviously a little bit more risk. Um, so he's going to be another guy that I'm interested in, in seeing. I, I feel like there's like a, an entire new system to, to yeah. follow this year, like a, a whole new top 30 of players who just weren't even around the last time <laughs> they were with baseball. Give me a uh, not named Cody Bolton because I think he's the most obvious choice here. Give me a pitcher and a hitter that is going to debut this year. Um, who's going to have the most impact? Pitcher and hitter. I mean, yeah, Bolton is the guy I'm looking forward to. Uh, obviously, uh, the two pitchers they got, um, Will Crow. I'm interested. I, I think there's a little bit more. Uh, when I first saw him after the uh, Josh Bell trade, 
thought, you know, maybe a number five starter, there could be a little bit more there, but nothing too exciting. Like some of the top pitching prospects you've seen. And then, uh, the guy they got from, uh, the Yankees, uh, is it uh, Yajore? Uh, Yajore, yeah. Yajore. Yeah. I, I'm horrible at pronouncing right. any yeah, names. Like, even like, you know, That's a yeah. guess, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, oh, but, it's okay, Tim. I'm fantastic <laughs> at pronouncing names. So, <laughs> so yeah, I would uh, – obviously, those two, like, uh, competing for the rotation. And then um, as far as a hitter goes, uh, I, I would really like to see uh, Jared Oliva get a uh, get a shot in the big leagues like you know more extended chance especially with outfield being wide open and center field being wide open it would be nice to see if he can get uh, get a better shot than last year and get a chance to, to uh, show what he can do you're not you a will Craig guy <laughs> I mean Craig has the best chance of any this year with Bell gone but also it doesn't speak well that they <laughs> Basically, just you know, they left him off the roster. It's yeah, it might be his last chance um, with this team, but yeah, I could see him getting a shot for sure. You mentioned Swaggerty. Just, I mean, first round yeah. pick. He's got the he's got the pedigree, but like thoughts on him. He just really hasn't developed the way we wanted him to. It seems. Yeah, and for him, like we're, I, I feel like that's. The, he's the player who we are most consistently getting questions on. Why are you lower on him? And I don't feel like we're too much lower on him. We're kind of saying the the same thing, but there is that concern of he hasn't played above a ball. Uh, he had some struggles with his swing. He is largely a first round pick because of offensive numbers that came at a very small school. I, I'm not saying that any of this, precludes him from being a good hitter in the majors one day, but I don't think we've seen enough to give him just endless benefit of the doubt, especially as a college hitter who has lost a full year, who, you know, hasn't played above a ball. There's, you you still need to see him develop the bat, which he hasn't had a chance to do yet. But I, I think that I, I could see them sending him to double A and that's, going to be another guy. I mean, I feel like we could talk on right about guys to watch in the system, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah, he's going to be really important because of just the long-term hole in center field. I think I'm higher on swagger to this year than most. Really? You of all people. I really am. I would have, I, I guess I'm, I'm not going to lie. I watched the swing and I was like, yeah, he's made some changes. I like it. So what do you, uh, what do you like about him? What? So it looks like he's shortened up a little bit with the stance. Mm-hmm. Loads a lot better. Mm-hmm. And I think he uses the lower half a lot more this year. Yeah. That's and what I like so far. But, I mean, obviously everyone looks great in batting practice. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the challenge is, you know, you can – the whole muscle memory, uh, you know, remembering the stance and everything. But going through a long season, that's where it – you know. I, I'm not counting him out. I, I don't think we're really too low on him because I still see an no. average or better starter. But it's definitely you're going to need to see something from him in games. And I, I like that there's you know the, the changes and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's, it's largely – I mean, it, I, I, I was told this early that the, the test for hitters is that jump to double A. The test for any prospect, really. But uh, – until then, it, it's just really easy to get ahead of yourself. And I I don't want to do that with Swaggerty this year, but I'm really excited to see how he can respond, especially because I feel like mm-hmm. the biggest thing is that he wasn't the type of player that Huntington's development system had a lot of success with. The the hitting profile, they they didn't they drafted a lot of those guys, but how many of them actually ended up making the majors that, you know kind of average tools across the board thing. I think that uh, it would be a real litmus test for uh, the new development system, seeing how he develops and how somebody like Matt Gorski as well develops, just seeing the the difference between last system and this one. 
Who outside of the top? You met you mentioned Smith, right? Um, so let's let's not say him again. But who outside of the top twenty could sneak their way into the top ten next year? Uh, definitely the um, you know some of the uh, international outfielders, uh, Solomon McGuire, uh, Rodolfo Nolasco. I like those guys. And then um, if we're gonna go. A little bit higher than that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I I would probably stick just with the uh, the international side. There were even some guys who got bumped from our uh, top fifty who I liked at the end of the list. Uh, Dario Lopez was one of those guys. Um, you know, there's there's a big group in our tier six right outside of our top fifty that I think. Maybe not jump all the way into the top 10, but they could definitely be in the top 30 next year. And uh, it's about five or six players that were going to finish up our top 50 before they got massively bumped off the list at the end. Gotcha. Cool. Well, that's like 90 minutes, you guys, <laughs> talking about Pirates right. minor league baseball. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I want to know before we go your sleepers this year. Let's fire them off. No mine. Everything that you said, Tim. Ooh. Ooh. So <laughs> you already you know mine. Us. <laughs> Man, Mine's I, already Alex Mojica. I'm trying to get a head start on next year's book, guys, and I can't get it with this kind of an answer. Come on, let's get you. <laughs> so, so I'm going to go with him. It's Mojica. Yeah. I'm going with. Already bumped um, up five spots. Then I got it. Thank you. I'm I'm going with the second round pick from last year's draft. Jared Jones. Mm. I like, mm. I like the arm, like the stuff seems like it's real good for the age. Um, I, I think that's someone who could eventually turn into that, you know, power right-handed arm that, that you could eventually be a potential top of the rotation type guy. So. I wish they'd develop him as a two-way yeah. player or somebody like, yeah, that'd be fun. That's yeah. <laughs> Nally. There we go. Oh, no, stop it. 2.0. Stop it, Tyler. John Van no. Benscoten. <laughs> we don't need nine walks per inning. <laughs> Anthony, what do you got? Who's your sleeper? Uh, man, you're putting me on this spot. That's why I brought you on, Tim. I'm not the, <laughs> the prospect guru over here. I'm not trying to tell right, you well, my top no sleeper, but, but what, what prospect are you looking forward to the most this year? Who I really want to look forward to the most. Um, I almost feel like Piguero. Like, I want to see what Piguero really is. And yeah. I know it's not like you're saying, it's not like, a, you know, who I'm, I mean, he's obviously a top 10 prospect, but I really want to see Piguero because, like, he, like we mentioned, it's we got the trade from the Marte deal. Mm -hmm. This is the guy who I think all of us pretty much feel like he's the one that's going to stick it short. So mm -hmm. he's the future. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of upside, a lot of talent in this kid. But, you know, you really haven't seen it. So, like, I think I'm most interested in finding out, like, what this kid really is. And, you know, do we really have a legit shortstop in our future? Um, you know, opposed to, of course, Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But because <laughs> everyone, everyone wants to watch Cruz, of course, you know. But, yeah, yeah. to me, I think it's Piguero. That's yeah. what I'm, like, really interested in. Yeah. And I think it's a really interesting dynamic, too, him being the first major acquisition for, uh, you know, for Charrington to – a lot of GMs when they're coming in rebuilding, they go for that shortstop. Well, he is that guy. So, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how he fits in with the rebuild and see what they, they saw in him to make that trade. I, the more time that's gone by, it, it's weird. Even though we haven't seen those guys, I like that trade better and better. Like it's. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I didn't, yeah, I, mean, I thought it was okay at first, you know, but right, it's like the more you set on it, the more it's 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 actually looks like it might be a really good trade. And of course, we lost the season, so we couldn't tell. So right. that's again why here we are this year. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I I'm think it's just for me, that. like seeing the uh, the actual plan play out after that. That this fits into that, but at the time we didn't know. We, you know, it was just true. Where are the pirates going? Are they going to actually do a rebuild, or are they going to? do this thing where they get out a dictionary and define the word build. And, you know, yeah, I, I think that uh, it was kind of a relief to see that trade followed up with all the trades this off season, but that trade in 
kind of hindsight with everything we've seen looks like the best one and a, a very good move for a rebuilding team at the start. Right. Cool. Well, cool, cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Tim. Um, I guess before yeah. you go, I have a, I have a couple questions for you. All right. Let's fire them off. What's next on the playlist and what's the beer you're drinking next? All right. Uh, so next on the playlist, um, See, what did I get in today? Uh, I think I got a um, the Spider Man Miles Morales uh, uh, soundtrack. Um, so I'll be I'll be listening <laughs> to that. I like listening to some uh, soundtracks while I'm doing some writing. So I've got uh, a couple articles I'm gonna pound out here tonight. Probably throw that on, and then uh, beer. I don't know. Maybe a. Uh, it's been raining nonstop here. Like. I, I can't remember the last time we haven't had rain. So I, I feel like like a a bitter, you know, like a, a classic, like old school style beer that just kind of reminds you of England, you know, just like something that's not Yingling? a heavy imperial stout. Like, Good Lord, <laughs> Yingling's dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> I did a voodoo ranger tonight. Nice. Well, I'm probably going to go for something from uh, my boys at Calusa down in Sarasota. So. If you're going down to spring training at some point, definitely check them out. Jim. Yeah, I just got go. just got some tickets to some games uh yesterday when I went on sale. Nice. So yeah. All right. It's gonna be good seeing baseball back this year. That's for sure. I mean oh, yeah. on the minor league side, for sure. I, it's been so long. But this was a lot of fun, guys. Yeah, it, it was. Hey. Thank you so much for coming on. Um again, you Absolutely. can find Tim, Pittsburgh Baseball Network. Um What's your Twitter handle, Tim? Go yeah, ahead. what have I changed it to this time? Uh, Tim Williams <laughs> PBN. Tim Williams PBN. Tim Williams PBN. So make sure you follow him. Um, definitely, if you're not already, this will be a great year to um, do so. Yeah. yeah. The start of many, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The restart of many. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a lot. For everyone yeah. else, we'll see you all um, next week. So, bye-bye. Later, guys. Later, Scouts. Later.